Welcome to the Whole Council Podcast. I'm John Snyder, and with us this week, we have a special guest, Dr. Stephen Ewell. Uh, you may not be familiar with Dr. Ewell's name. Uh, you might have heard him preach at some conferences recently. He's always a favorite. Um, and you may have seen some of the books that he has recently written or edited uh, but we're really glad to have Dr. Yule with us today. He's been a very encouraging, bright spot in the um, Puritan theologian, you know, historian uh, area of evangelicalism. And so we're going to spend some time with him today. I hope it's beneficial. This week, talking with Dr. Stephen Yule, and um, I was uh, talking with Dr. Yule uh, before Teddy started recording about some of his books. I have a list of your books that um, I have 20 here, but some of them are sets that you've worked on, like William Perkins, uh, and some of them are individual books, and some of them are smaller books like these. And uh, the way that I came across Dr. Yule uh, was through this book called Great Spoil, Thomas Manton's Spirituality of the Word. And it's his treatment of or kind of stealing the best from Manton on Psalm 119. And if you don't have that set, this is, um, uh, here is the three-volume set. So it's quite a substantial commitment to read through Manton on Psalm 119. And um, when I found this book uh, and read it, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised at how uh, Dr. Yule had put it put into such a small book, depth and clarity, theological, biblical clarity, but warmth. Uh, so it really just the best of all worlds. And there are many other books. This is another one that I picked up, The Inner Sanctum of Puritan Piety, John Flavel's Doctrine of Mystical Union with Christ. And uh, so, of course, such a central doctrine for everything in the Christian life, both the objective truths and the practical subjective application of those truths. And on the desk here, uh, Teddy said you can see this uh, in, in your shot. There's this giant book. It's um, a book that someone gave me when I graduated with a master's degree. It's John Flavel's Complete Works. So you can read a couple of thousand pages, or you can pick this up and kind of dip your toe in the deep end, and then begin to follow up with uh, John Flavel's works themselves. Well, Dr. Yule, can you just give us a, a quick introduction of kind of your professional life, um, ministry, teaching, where are you at, where have you been? Very good. Um, born and raised in Toronto, Toronto, Ontario, and uh, completed most of my studies in Toronto before embarking on my PhD at the London School of Theology. Uh, my supervisor was Tony Lane. Some of your audience might be familiar with Dr. Lane and his work on John Calvin. And that was back in the late, oh, early 2000s, I suppose, and completed my PhD. And uh, since then, I have pastored in Ontario, where I'm from originally, and pastored in Texas and uh, taught at several institutions, including Toronto Baptist uh, Seminary and uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And then I spent a couple of years at Heritage Baptist Theological Seminary back up in Canada in the city of Cambridge. And I'm currently the professor of church history and spiritual formation at the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. And so we live close to Fort Worth in the town of Granbury, my wife and I, and our youngest daughter, who's still at home. And I also am the preaching pastor at uh, Fairview Fairview Baptist Church, not far from our home in uh, in Granbury. So that's, yeah, pastored um, off and on for a better part of 20 years and been involved in theological education now for about the same the same period of time. Um, how did you get started with the Puritan writers, and um, particularly George Swinnick? 
it's uh you know we talk about god's providence it certainly was because i i fell into the puritans literally um and then stumbled upon george swinnick um i was completing my mdiv at tyndale seminary in toronto and i mean i knew who the puritans were because i had completed an mts at toronto baptist seminary and they have some you know affiliation with puritan theology and spirituality so i had some knowledge of the puritans but not much and i i needed an elective to finish my mdiv and there was an elective that just kind of fit my course schedule on uh puritan piety and the required reading was j.i packer's a quest for godliness mm -hmm. john bunyan's pilgrim's progress jonathan edwards religious affections and richard baxter the reformed pastor and that was just an epiphany for me. I had read a little bit of John Owen's snippets here and there. Of course, I was familiar with Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, but really had no grasp on who the, who the Puritans were and their contribution to English Reformed theology and their vision of the Christian life. So really, Dr. Packer's book was, um, that was, that was paradigm shifting for me. And I graduated that end of that semester and decided in the middle of that course I was going to do PhD studies. I had no inkling prior to that moment of engaging in PhD studies, but the Puritans got such a hold on me, transformed my thinking theologically, ecclesiastically, and I started to look around at institutions where I might study, Puritans I might look at, and I was uh, I was down a little uh, town of St. Catharines in southern Ontario, not far from Niagara Falls. So your listeners will be familiar with Niagara Falls as a geographical location. Not far from there, St. Catharines is where my, where my wife grew up and my in-laws lived at the time. And there was a little bookstore, maybe a 10-minute drive from, from the house that I would visit occasionally. And it was associated with Reformation heritage books. Mm was actually Dr. Joel Beakey's brother. It was his workshop, and he had a little storefront um, attached to this workshop where they would make door frames and windows and this sort of thing. And it was just a tiny little shop, but just packed full of RHB publications and mostly Puritan republications. And so I was, I was just browsing the shelves on this particular day thinking about PhD yes. studies, and then this five-volume set, ghastly orange color, yes. caught my attention. The works of George Swinnick. I'd never even heard of him before that moment. I grabbed one of these volumes, sat down, and read it for about an hour, and that was it. I don't recommend this to any prospective PhD students, but right there on the spot, I decided I'm going to do my PhD on this guy. And uh, traveled not that long after to London and met with my supervisor. And uh, that was it. The next four and a half years of my life immersed in the writings of George Swinnick. So there was no planning, no real forethought. I say simply God's good providence uh, taking me by the hand and leading me through a, a number of different circumstances to, to bring me through first to PhD studies and then to focus secondly on George Swinnick. How would you um, advise a person? Uh, because I think that um, the way a person could approach Puritan writings today would be very different than 30 years ago or 40 years ago um, because of the popularity of um, Puritans, the, the republication of their works, the availability of them uh, online as well as in stores. And just the, you know, the benefit of the internet, being able to locate any Puritan writing almost immediately. Um, so there's, we're kind of spoiled for choice. So if a person were to say to you, I I've heard so many good things about these 17th century pastors, how, how, would, I, um, how would you suggest that they kind of enter into or approach reading the Puritans today? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I'm thinking 
I'm thinking strictly in terms of your average man, your average woman in the pew who's, um, you know, heard of the Puritans, maybe picked up one or two volumes and, okay, where do I go from here? Uh, I usually recommend first step, the Puritan treasures for today, which are a, a series published by Reformation Heritage Books. Mm. I think they might be up to 15 or 16 volumes. Mm. And so these are works that are have been edited, the language modernized and simplified to a degree, but they really make the Puritans just very accessible, very readable, and introduce you then to a a, a number of different Puritans and a broad um, spectrum in terms of themes, thematically. Mm. So just a wonderful intro to Puritan writings at a very comfortable, accessible level. From there, mm. I always encourage people to think in terms of subjects and motifs that interest you and then go looking for a Puritan volume or volumes, the Banner of Truth series, very helpful, the Soli Deo Gloria series, and just look for particular books that speak to themes or subject matters that are, are of particular interest to you. I think that's very edifying. And then the third major step, I often encourage people to embrace a Puritan and um, read that Puritan's works in their entirety. Again, I, I'm and, and this I may get some pushback from this, or you might get some pushback from this, but I encourage people to stay away. Uh, just your average reader, I encourage them to stay away from John Owen, Thomas Goodwin, Richard Baxter. I mean, Goodwin and, and Owen, they are phenomenal. They are theologians, but they were university professors. Baxter, he has his strong points but at times is not the most, um, I don't find, is always the most gratifying read. What you want are the preachers. You want the pastors. And to familiarize yourself with one of those men who week in, week out, was ministering to a flock. Because then that just comes through in the writings and will speak to you in ways that some of these others can't and won't. Although they're valuable. I mean, Goodwin has some... Wonderful stuff, obviously, on Christology. And Owen takes you to, you know, beautiful heights, his communion with God. But if you're just thinking of mastering one Puritan, a pastor, a shepherd, and someone who's manageable, I usually recommend John Flavel. Um, his works aren't that daunting. You don't have to read everything in there, but there is such breadth and depth where you'll find in the likes of a John Owen, a friend for life. It will speak to different, uh, obviously, subject matters, different struggles, different issues, different complexities that arise in the Christian journey. Just a real, you know, as the Puritans are known, just a real physician of the soul. So that's usually my three-step process. And then after that, sure, start getting into the Owen and the Goodwin and others and more what we might say complex Puritan works, but I think that's a good way to ease in because I find at times young men, young women, they might start at the back end and it can become a little daunting or discouraging. I think this kind of approach is far more manageable and it's certainly rewarding. I remember reading um, the first book I read by John Flavel, which I would, I too think uh, he's a great place for a person to just park there and, um, you know, and for him to become, like you mentioned, uh, kind of a lifelong friend to walk alongside you. Uh, you know, you can read, some writers are so helpful that you, that you can read them and they can haunt you in a beneficial way. You know, sometimes they're convicting, but e even, in, even in their rebuke to your conscience, um, they are writers that have, that constantly point you back to Christ. And I remember Flavel's book, um, uh, on the fountain of life, uh, on it, basically a, a series of sermons on the work and person of Christ. And it was like, um, just, it was just golden 
um, it wasn't difficult when you consider it was written a couple centuries ago. It was kind of like reading Spurgeon. Um, so it wasn't effortless, but it was worth it. And then I found his kind of his follow-up work to that, the method of grace. And for me, that that really clarified early on in my Christian life, how does God shepherd a soul? Pneumatology, the work of the Spirit. How does he take all that the Father has planned and the Son has purchased and bring it to bear on a life? And if I can understand that, does that change the way I reach out to a brother next to me um, or the way I pastor or the way I raise my kids? Um, so I think John Flavel really is just um, sterling when it comes to those, those issues. Um, you've written a number of books. Can you, if, if someone were to say to you, Dr. Yule, I'm very busy, but I would like to read a couple of your works could you suggest a couple that you would say, if you don't read anything else that I've written, consider these? What would you recommend? Well, that's a good question. Um, in terms of the books I've actually written, I think that little book you referenced earlier by on John Flavel, um, The Inner Sanctum of Puritan Piety, it's, uh, it's brief and to the point. Um, it's paradigmatic in terms of a better understanding of the doctrine of union with Christ and how it then shapes what we might call spiritual formation, biblical spirituality, whatever expression we want to use. I think that's just a really helpful uh, foundation stone in terms of our, our thinking as, as Christians and uh, who we are in the Lord Jesus and the implications of that. So I often recommend that one in terms of, you know, works I've I've written on the Puritans. In terms of the Puritans themselves, works I have edited, the big two, I mean, just staying with John Flavel, you just referenced it, The Fountain of Life. And I, I edited that work, and it's available in two volumes, uh, Christ Humbled Yet Exalted and Christ's Threefold Office. And so again, the language modernized, and I know there are a lot of purists out there. I get some pushback sometimes when I edit and modernize the language, and some say you shouldn't do that. I say, well, that's fine. I wasn't thinking about you. I was thinking about that other brother, sister in the church for whom reading you know, 16th, 17th century English isn't at the top of their favorite things to do. We want to make it accessible and digestible. And so I did that with The Fountain of Life, and it's available through RHB, those two volumes. I mean, that is just, I mean, Christology, it's, um, I like to say you don't need anything else. If you've read that and mastered it, it's the sort of book you will read again and again. The other mm -hmm. is the little work I edited, um, The Blessed and Boundless God by George mm -hmm. Swinnick originally published as the incomparableness of God. And so many of your your, mm -hmm. your many of your you know the members of your audience will be familiar with Stephen Sharnick, the mm -hmm. existence and attributes of God. Sure, have at it, read it. Um, it's tremendous. But if you want something a little more condensed, um, concise, I hate to use the word simple, but I'll use it simple, certainly doxological, um, and falling within the parameters then of classical theism, and just wonderfully God-exalting, the blessed and boundless God, in terms of theology proper, is I, I edited that, I don't know how many years ago, and I still read it once a year in my personal devotions, because I find it just so God honoring and and the puritans had that wonderful wonderful ability to explain theology not merely as the collection of a you know a series of abstract ideas about god but really celebrate theology in a very doxological manner that just leads you to to worship and serve and obey our god father son and spirit so those would be yes. the big two 
Um, when I think of works that I've edited yeah. that, well, I go back and read them again. So that's, you know, there are other works yeah. I've edited I've never gone back to, but those two I go back to repeatedly. Yeah, I think using uh, Swinnick's small book on uh, the boundless and blessed God is a great way to follow up Stephen Sharnock. If you really push through the 800 plus pages of Sharnock, you can go to uh, Swinnick's book, and it's like he, it's like a, a reminder of all those wonderful things that Sharnock said in a very portable way. A histor- an interesting historical side note. I've never taken the time to investigate this, but I'd like to sometime, you know, next time I'm in England, that part of the world. But when uh, Sharnock went up to Oxford to complete his MA, um, Swinnick, they were at the same college. Swinnick was a chaplain, so they knew each other. And it's interesting. It would be always in, it'd be interesting to me to try to discover to what degree they interacted, because Sharnak has the existence and attributes of God. Swinnick has the incomparableness of God. They both seem to be fairly dependent upon Amandus Polanus. And it would just be an interesting thing to, well, how much did these men interact and uh, share their ideas and even what they were writing because they certainly would have um, rubbed shoulders at different junctures at Oxford University. Well, Dr. Yule, thank you for uh, giving us your time. I know you're a busy man and thank you for the insights and practical suggestions for the Puritans. And really we are also grateful for the, uh, you know, the, the hard work of taking old works and devoting you know, portions of your life to make those available for uh, today's generation. Those are very helpful. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Great to be with you. We're thankful again for Dr. Yule spending time with us today. Uh, If you want to pick up some of his books and start to read them, they are manageable and very readable, but deep and helpful. Again, uh, one that he mentioned was The Inner Sanctum of Puritan Piety by John Flavel. And I mentioned reading uh, his work on Thomas Manton's Spirituality of the Word, which deals with Psalm 119 and what Manton said. Some of the key points boiled down in a very manageable size. Um, One reason we had Dr. Ewell on today is because of his writings, but another is that he is going to be doing a mini-study for Media Gratier in the coming year. We'll be filming him in June of 2024.